Welcome to the True IT webinar, Move to the Cloud. I'm your presenter, Wes Henry. I'm the President and Chief Information Officer at True IT. Today's topic, we're gonna to talk about cloud and the move to the cloud, how cloud can benefit your business and how you can meet any challenges with cloud. And our focus is gonna be specifically on Microsoft's cloud service called Azure. So we're gonna talk a little bit real briefly about what is the cloud, pros and cons of cloud services, types of clouds, types of cloud services, what works for small and medium businesses, and also how we can increase our cybersecurity with cloud solutions. And we'll look at an overview of cloud solutions out there. We'll talk a little bit about why or why not to select Azure, and then best strategies for adopting the cloud or migrating to the cloud, and then our conclusion. So with that, I'll get started. <clears throat> First, what is the cloud? And I think the cloud is something that we're familiar enough with that most people kind of have a feeling for the cloud. And unfortunately, it doesn't really have an exact definition even today. But basically, the cloud is made up of some core elements. So number one is it is a group of servers, typically a very large network of servers and storage that are hosted and controlled, managed by someone else. They're connected together so that they can share workloads and share data between them. They're available via the internet, and the way that we consume them or use them is a pay-by-usage scenario, which shifts our costs to an operating expense because we're paying as we use them on an ongoing basis versus a capital expense where we're purchasing up infrastructure servers and networking equipment and putting them in our own uh, environment, in our own facility. So that's kind of like the four, or excuse me, five key pieces uh, that make up the cloud. So what are the pros and cons of cloud? So there's a lot of pros to clouds. First of all, uh, cloud services can be highly scalable. This is very important. If we're putting our important workloads in the cloud, we wanna make sure that the cloud has the capacity to handle them. And the nice, other nice thing about not only just having the capacity, but also the ability to scale up or scale down as our business needs change. Uh, by comparison, if we were to buy traditional infrastructure, we need to size it according to what our highest demand is going to be, but yet all the time that we're utilizing it where we don't have that full demand, we've essentially wasted money on that infrastructure because it's overbuilt for those other times of lower need. Another pro of cloud services is reliability and fault tolerance. Um, because of the way that the clouds are architected, they have a large, a large uh, collection of servers, and those servers are uh, set up in a way that makes them very fault tolerant, very redundant, um, and that's really important. In addition, it's not just one set of servers. Uh, the major clouds, cloud providers all provide geo-redundancy as well, uh, and what that means is that there's more than one data center and your data and your servers can be spread across more than one location. These can even be worldwide if you so choose, um, and that enables your servers, your, your infrastructure, your services to survive even catas catastrophes like hurricanes, you know, major power outages, um, major outages in internet backbone and things like that because you can rely on the services in another data center in those cases. Another pro of cloud services is that they're accessible from anywhere. So these servers that are in the cloud um, they're accessible via the internet. So basically anywhere that you have good internet access, you can access your cloud services. And that makes it really easy for remote workers to work, uh, makes it really easy if your organization has multiple locations, you'll be able to connect all of those things up to the cloud. We don't have to set up things like VPNs and so on in order to get access to that data. It also means that the speed um, <clears throat> and performance is equivalent for everybody no matter where they're located. In a more traditional or older school environment, we might have servers located in our prime headquarters, and they're really fast for everybody there, but anybody who's remote or anybody in the other locations, uh, they see a major performance degradation because they have to connect you know, remotely across long distance over a VPN, things like that. With the cloud, everything goes to one spot, so the performance is the same for everybody. Another pro of the cloud is that it offloads maintenance and support. So this is a really big pro of the cloud. Um, and it's often underlooked in terms of uh, pricing and, and cost calculations is that by moving infrastructure into the cloud, <clears throat> maintenance and support is taken care of by the cloud provider. And so that reduces that requirement on our internal IT staff. Security is another pro of cloud services. Um, some people question the security of cloud services. You know, the fact that it's, these are on you know, well-known public service um, uh, environments. 
that they're likely to you know, be attacked and, and have hackers going after them. And while that's definitely true, they also have a lot of resources behind them to ensure that they're secure, that they're patched up to date, that they're monitored, that intrusions are detected and shut down and so on. I would venture to say that the primary cloud service providers like Amazon, Microsoft, and Google have significantly larger security budgets than pretty much any other uh, business or organization out there. So they're, they're able to provide a lot higher level of security for their services. I already mentioned the next one, so pay for usage. Um, that transi transitions our IT expenses into an operating expense from a capital expense. It makes it easier to budget for. We don't have these large replacement projects every three to five years um, that are very disruptive and cost a lot of money. And we don't have to try to predict what our usage, what our you know, requirements are going to be over the next period of time and be concerned that if we underbuy, now we've wasted money. If we overbuy, we've wasted money. Um, and that makes it really difficult, especially in a business that's growing or changing as well. Uh, another pro of the cloud is just that they're very highly tested because they're utilized by you know, organizations all across the world. There is constant scrutiny on the operations of these things. They, they produce very tried and true solutions, and that's a, a huge plus for businesses. As we rely on those cloud services, we don't have to worry that they're you know, fringe, bleeding edge, um, flaky, that kind of stuff. Another pro is that there's just a vast offering of products and services out there. Uh, we'll talk more about what the different kinds are here, but knowing that there's practically everything and anything we could need out there makes it really easy to try to, to find solutions that fit our business and be able to adopt them easy. They're faster to deploy than in-house infrastructure. Um, we'll demonstrate how easy it is to spin up a server in Azure in just a little bit, and that's a classic example. We can put a new server in Azure in way less time than we could procure a server, uh, plug it in, install Windows on it, do patching, updates, and so on uh, in-house. So it's significantly, significantly faster. And the last one is just that it's evolving rapidly. Um, there's, a, there's a major push for all the cloud providers to increase the amount of products and services they offer, to increase the value that they're delivering, and, and to innovate. And so that results in uh, lots of evolution and a very fast evolution. Some of the cons of cloud services, obviously, because these, this infrastructure is in the cloud, we have to have internet access to access it. Um, so that's a point of failure that we have to look at, and we maybe have to take a different approach to our internet access than we would have in the past. However, I would argue that this so much is done via the internet today that an internet outage or internet failure is a significant uh, issue for businesses, even if they're not utilizing the cloud. They very likely still depend on uh, the internet for their email, for example. Many businesses would not function very well without email. So if their internet's down and their email's down, it's still a major issue. More and more businesses are using voice over IP phone systems, and the same situation is true there. In fact, voice over IP is a version of cloud, right? And so same thing, if your phone system is down or phone services are down because your internet has an outage, that's a major issue. Um, some other cons of the cloud is that because there's so much variability and so many uh, options and ways to do things in the cloud, uh, it can get complicated determining exactly what the pricing is going to be for certain types of, types of cloud scenarios. Um, once it's in place, obviously, um, it's easier to manage that going forward, but it can be a little bit difficult to predict sometimes. Uh, next, there are some limitations with cloud services. So, you know, one advantage of having in-house infrastructure is it's completely yours. You can design it and operate it any way that you see fit. That's not always exactly true in the cloud. There are certain kinds of limitations to what can be put in the cloud, what can be operated in the cloud, and how it can be operated and so on. One disadvantage or con that people sometimes bring up is the fact that you never own your infrastructure. Um, this is very much a, a rental model versus an owning model, and that is true. If your intent is to own your infrastructure, that you'll never accomplish that within the cloud. Um, my counter to that is that who wants to own 10-year-old IT infrastructure? Uh, you know, pretty much nobody. We all are aware of the fact that there's a need to advance our IT and replace the, our aging IT infrastructure. And by utilizing the cloud, that process is done for us automatically. So in a way, this is really, in my opinion, as much a pro for the cloud as it is a con. Um, another con, though, is that we, we don't have control over that upgrade schedule necessarily. So if we have an application that depends on certain kind of infrastructure um, or we're utilizing more uh, advanced cloud things such as software as a service, uh, we have very limited control over their upgrade schedule. And so that can sometimes cause issues of its own. And then the last one I put on here is that the cloud services are evolving rapidly. So 
You might be aware that I mentioned that as my last pro. Uh, there's a lot of good for rapid evolution, but there can be some cons to rapid evolution as well. Um, cloud providers can sometimes change or restructure the way that their services work, and that can sometimes result in us in the business uh, having to revamp our IT or our utilization of those cloud services. So it can be a pro and it can be a con kind of at the same time. So types of clouds. Um, they're generally broken up into three categories. So the one that most of us think about when, when the word cloud comes to mind is the idea of a public cloud. Um, and that doesn't mean that the data is public. It means that the service is available for consumption by the public. Um, so that means that businesses and individuals are able to go and sign up for these services and be able to utilize those services um, without having to do anything special. The, the service is just ready to go, ready for them to sign up. So two, two examples of this, uh, Azure is obviously one of those, and then Amazon Web Services is another example. Those are also uh, the two largest providers of cloud services. Um, so they're uh, perfect examples of that. The next category is private clouds. So a private cloud uses same similar kinds of technology as a public cloud, meaning that there are uh, a group of servers and they're networked together in a way that they can share data and share workloads and things like that. However, um, they're private in the sense that they're owned by one organization or one company, one entity, and they're not available for use and consumption by the public. Uh, typically, they're set up in order to provide the data and services that they provide for the company that owns them. Um, and the owner, therefore, bears all the costs of the equipment itself and the maintenance and support and so on. So there's still a very large capital expense um, for rolling out your own public cloud. And then the third example here is hybrid clouds. So hybrid clouds are a combination of public and private uh, clouds that are uh, architected to work together. So they can share workloads and they can share information, they can share data back and forth, and able to ideally take advantage of the benefits on the private side and the benefits on the public side. Uh, and like you would expect, they kind of fall in between where there's less maintenance than full public because you don't have to maintain the public side, but you still do have the maintenance support and costs of the private side. And I would argue <clears throat> there's maybe a little bit more complexity uh, at least in the initial stages, because they do have you do have to architect them and integrate them together. Whereas a fully private cloud, you know, is its own standalone entity, and a fully public cloud, you don't have to worry about any integration because it's already good to go. So within clouds, there's different types of services or levels of service, if if you want to call it that. So the lowest level, the most basic level, is called the infrastructure as a service. Um, and this is the, basically, like I said, it's the lowest level. So this is raw storage, you know, the avail availability of putting data on this cloud. It's uh, raw servers, so the availability of utilizing compute power. But they're not defined in how they operate, right? They're, they're very much just uh, building blocks that you use to architect the solutions that you want to build the services that you yourself want out of the cloud. The next layer up is called platform as a service. And so this takes advantage of the infrastructure that's already there, servers, storage, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but it layers on a, a specific, um, it takes that raw stuff and it starts to define exactly what it's going to deliver. So two examples of this are databases and file storage. So for example, um, we can take a server and put it in the cloud and we can totally control that server and we can make it a database server. We could install a SQL server on it, for example, or we can also just purchase Azure SQL from Microsoft, which is already runs at, which already runs SQL and has the benefits that it's already highly scalable. It's clustered in the back end. And so we don't have to worry about the scalability of it. Whereas if we put our own server in, then we have to worry about if it's sized right, if it has enough compute power, we have to monitor if it's using up all of its storage and increase that when necessary and so on. Um, so it provides a little more uh, convenience and a little more power, if you will, out of the box top later is referred to as software as a service. And this is another type of cloud that we're all very familiar with. Um, so there's a software that we utilize basically over the web, over the, you know, uh, through a browser. That's going to be an example of software as a service. So software as a service is built on an infrastructure. Oftentimes there's platform components that feed into it. And then at the top layer, there is the, the user interface that we interact with. And so some examples of this, for example, are Office 365, uh, G Suite, QuickBooks Online, Salesforce. Those are examples of software as a service. You sometimes hear uh, people refer to other kinds of cloud services. Um, a couple that I've heard of before, one is called desktop as a service. 
Another is called business process as a service. And there's others out there as well. But most of the time, those are really just either specific use cases or specific configuration cases of one of these three main components or three main types of cloud services, or there's some kind of a combination of them as well. So most any uh, cloud service can really be broken down into one of these three or some kind of combination of these three. So where should small businesses and medium-sized businesses look to when they're thinking, considering adopting the cloud? Um, and the easiest to adopt is software as a service. Um, because these are already canned, these already work, um, again, they're out of the box, we can sign up for them, and they're, they're ready to get started. And again, I mentioned a couple examples of these, so Office 365, for example, um, is a really good example. G Suite, very similar to that, right? QuickBooks, Salesforce, those kind of things. If your primary software has a cloud option available, that's the easiest place to start. So if you have a line of business software and it has a cloud version available, there's often a direct migration path there where you can take the existing data that you have and migrate it right into that cloud solution. Um, and then the support is the same. Your staff doesn't have to learn an entirely new system, things like that. So that's definitely the easiest place to start with getting um, transitioned over to using more cloud services. And I would venture to guess most businesses have already started adopting some kinds of cloud services in one way or another. It's really rare to find a business nowadays that doesn't use either Office or 65 or G Suite or some kind of online you know, QuickBooks or other online accounting or things like Dropbox. That's another example of a software as a service. Uh, Zoom is a software as a service, right? Um, because we're, we're purchasing the ability to, to have video calls and we don't have to provide the servers and the networking and everything behind the scenes to enable those video calls. Um, so there's, those are just a few examples. And like I said, you know, it's extremely rare to find a business or organization nowadays that hasn't adopted some of those. So I would just encourage any business um, that, you know, that wants to continue their cloud migration, cloud adoption strategy to look for more examples like that. Another piece is obviously the, the platform as a service, because this can help with scalability and reliability. So we don't necessarily have to change a lot about our environment to be able to utilize this. If we have an application today that works with SQL Server and we feel like we want more power or more scalability, more reliability, et cetera, out of that SQL Server, we can go purchase additional SQL servers uh, or additional hardware to beef up our existing one. We can cluster them together. We can build that out, right? However, another option is to use something like Azure SQL where we can connect to a SQL uh, platform that's already in the cloud. It's already hosted for us. It's maintained and supported and updated for us and it's incredibly scalable and powerful. So that's a way that we could increase our performance and our scalability in our, in our application without having to replace our application itself because we're, we're just replacing the database backend with another equivalent database backend um, that's you know, ar architected and engineered to a higher level, a more scalable level. Um, but our front end software all stays the same. So that's very, you know, very low impact on our users, for example. <clears throat> another one is file storage. Uh, files are one of the easiest workloads there are to move into the cloud. Uh, Azure provides us numerous ways that we can do that. So um, in, in like raw, pure Azure format, there's an example of just Azure files. So this essentially provides a network file or a network, excuse me, network share. Um, many of us are used to having named mapped drives on our networks, right? So we might have our local C drive, but then we have a, a network drive that's like our H drive or U drive or something like that. Um, Azure files is a, is a a cloud version of that where we can have that network share hosted via Azure um, and we can connect to it from our standard desktops and servers and to us it doesn't appear any different. There's, there's no user uh, signal that tells them that this is a cloud provided share versus a local share for example. Um, so it's a, an easy way to take something that again we're already used to and already using, move it to the cloud but get the benefits of the incredible scalability and flexibility and power of the cloud. So those are just two uh, simple examples of that. Um, Azure does provide other ways too that we can move files to the cloud. So uh, um, for example, SharePoint um, is actually you know, hosted on top of Azure and we can move files into SharePoint or OneDrive or things like that too. So there's more than one way to do this. And the last one is infrastructure as a service. So um, in some ways, this is the most direct or straightforward. Um, in other ways, it can be the most complicated. But the idea here is that we take servers and infrastructure that we have in-house and we move them to virtual servers and virtual infrastructure that live inside of Azure. 
So one advantage of this over the others is that because it's a one-to-one -one with servers, the applications and the configurations that run in-house and that have been proven and tested out today can be migrated into the cloud and, and maintained the exact same relationship and the exact same configuration. Um, and so that means we can take things where the manufacturer or vendor isn't providing a cloud option, but we can still take them from in-house, on-premise, into the cloud um, ourselves. And in terms of support, they're still just running on a server, so we can get the same support from the vendor and uh, same functionality and everything. But again, we gain some of the benefits of the cloud, um, you know, being able to be accessed from anywhere, the ability to back it up and, and the high reliability and so on that come along with being in the cloud as well. At the expense of having to do the same kind of maintenance and support that we did in-house, we still have to do that in the cloud because, again, we're, we're, we're controlling and configuring all of those virtual servers ourselves. One of the questions that um, we get about the cloud, and I think this is happening less and less as people's trust for the cloud has increased, um, but certainly this was a question that was very high in everybody's mind in the early days of cloud services, is just how secure is the cloud? Um, you know, uh, business owners and, and IT managers, they were comfortable with the idea of, I've got antivirus, I've got firewalls, you know, I've got um, phishing protection, you know, I've got all of these things in place today that work to protect my local network. If I move this stuff to the cloud, I have no idea how it's being managed and maintained. And I know that lots of people have access to that cloud, you know, in, in the same way that I would as an IT manager, right? I can manage my subscriptions. Plus, they're a large target. So, you know, are these things out there such large targets that they're getting hacked every day? You know, my, my, if somebody gets in, they've got access to everybody's data. You know, those are some of the concerns. Um, and while they're very valid concerns, I would argue that uh, in today's environment, this, the cloud is more secure than most business networks. And why do I say that? Well, number one, um, you've got a kind of physical protection, a, a bandwidth protection against denial of service attacks through the massive scale of the cloud that that very, very few businesses could afford to, to replicate on their own. And what that means is that you've got the scalability across the, the cloud provider and across their data centers that if there's an attack going on at one, you can use the services and the data and the bandwidth of another one, for example, um, and the, your, your application, your data, your access is not being shut down or blocked by that denial of service attack. Another thing is that these cloud providers have dedicated 24-7 security teams. So they've got a team of people who are you know, highly trained, highly engaged, uh, actively working on securing that it, the, the cloud, the services, the, the infrastructure, the servers, all of those kind of pieces, and being able to respond to threats when they are detected. And additionally, they can respond to things like denial of service attacks, for example. That same team or, or maybe perhaps a, a sister team is also involved in maintenance and patching, making sure that all of the devices within the network are as secure as possible. Um, and that's also really important. Um, you know, so outdated software or vulnerabilities in software are still to this day one of the major ways that attackers are able to get into and penetrate a network. A couple other benefits is the ability to roll back if compromised. So through Azure, for example, um, we can set up Azure Backup or we can just set up redundant virtual machines and have the ability to spin those up and replace the existing ones if they're ever compromised in, in any way, whatever. Um, the ability to quickly uh, reconfigure to defend if necessary. So again, if we're seeing some kind of you know, attack going on against certain kind of servers or a certain part of our infrastructure, um, we can reconfigure the infrastructure, still keep things running um, but take that piece out of the equation or perhaps just beef up that uh, particular thing if it's getting, um, if it's having, seeing a lot of increased workload, for example, uh, similar to like a denial of service attack. Uh, we can just beef that one part up. We don't have to go and, and invest extra resources in the whole rest of the network that's not being attacked. And then there's uh, numerous cloud security protections available. So Azure, for example, provides Azure Information Protection, which we'll talk about just briefly later, and Azure Threat Protection, and Windows Defender, and Conditional Access. And these are just a, a touching a tip of the iceberg, tip, touching just a very, very few of the options that are available within Azure. So <clears throat> next, we're going to switch over here. I'm going to uh, exit out of my PowerPoint. And I'm going to start just a quick demo to show you some of the capabilities inside of Azure. So um, here I am inside of the, the home of the Azure dashboard. So when I first log into the Azure management interface, this is what that looks like. Oh, hold on. Um, I don't think I exited my PowerPoint properly. Let me try this again.
There we go. Hopefully that's better. Okay, so uh, I'll back up. Here I am inside the home of the Azure dashboard. So this is what it looks like when I log into the Azure management portal. And you'll see here, um, I've got some, you know, some quick links kind of at the top here. I've got a list of some of my recent resources and then some tools and so on. Um, this is very, very simplified. So I can also look at, for example, my Azure dashboard. Um, this shows me a little bit more information. And then um, we can go in and we can look at all of the services available through Azure. And really, even this is, um, it doesn't really give you the full impact of everything that Azure can do because within many of these options that are available here, there can be a tremendous amount of subcategories or sub options within this too. So you can see that Azure has this broken down. I'll scroll back up to the top. Um, so Azure has this broken down basically on a group of general kinds of services. Um, so these are the things like resource groups that connect things together, the service health, um, and so on. Um, so starting with compute here, so this is the compute power. So these are the virtual machines, virtual servers, and so on, for example, if you want to spin those up. And it's, it's much more nuanced than just servers um, and virtual machines within Azure. So we'll talk about a few of these, but we don't have time to get into all of them. Um, virtual machines is obviously the obvious one here, but um, we'll talk a little bit about app services too, which is not exactly an entire virtual machine. It's more of a platform as a service. Um, so we don't necessarily have to configure everything about these. They're sort of like out of the box configured servers or services, for example. Um, sorry about that. And then another one here we've got is this idea of Azure function apps. Um, so this is another thing that um, doesn't it's not intuitive for most people who haven't experienced this or haven't thought about this before, but basically we can take uh, the ability to take a little bit of programming code and we can host that in Azure and then it can get called by either other processes within our business or other software or things like that. Um, and it can, it can be used to connect two different systems. So for example, if we've got a inventory management system and we've got an order tracking system, we could use something like an Azure function, for example, to be notified when something changes in one system and then update the other system to keep them in sync. Um, that's just a really simple case. There's lots more that can be done with it, for example. So networking um, is, you know, it's fundamental, obviously, of any cloud because we talked about how its servers connected together. There's tons of options available here. Um, we'll talk a little bit about like the um, front door CDN, um, for example, when we get to, uh, a little bit later here. But we also have this idea that we can do load balancers and we can do virtual networks and VPNs. So we can take everything that's in Azure and we can keep it uh, available only to us privately by connecting it via VPN back to our you know, main office, for example. Um, so that's a really powerful capability. This is especially true if we start talking about hybrid where we want some servers local and some servers in the cloud and they need to be able to talk. You know, we want as direct a channel as possible between those two so we can set up a virtual PM, a VPN virtual private network between them. Um, load balancers is another example though where, you know, load balancing in servers is not, um, it's not super simple. And so the ability to provide load balancing to our Azure infrastructure um, is really nice and uh, so much of it can work very easily just like right out of the box. So that's really cool too. Storage is a big key component of any cloud service. Um, it's one of the primary uses of cloud. <clears throat> and so you'll see that Azure has a lot of uh, storage options here as well. Um, so there are things that are just basic, like I mentioned, um, Azure files, for example. Um, there's capabilities here to like, you know, explore what storage we've got in here. Um, there's the ability to do more complex things like analytics through this. Um, and lots, lots and lots of options there too. So um, web is another major workload in Azure or in cloud services. Um, and so we have the ability here to put virtual servers and make them web servers. We've got the ability to use um, Azure web services and we've got the ability to do like content delivery networks and things like that as well in here. Um, I'll go into more of those in a little bit. Um, so uh, mobile is app services, notification hubs. So notification hubs is a communication tool that can be used to push out notifications to mobile devices, for example. Um, and then this idea of the power platform here, which is like power apps. Um, and we can make essentially mobile apps um, through a nice, uh, very simple interface, as simple as it can be for, for development um, and make our own apps that are you know, tied in with our business data. And that tie-in is very, very easy, especially if that data lives within Azure, obviously. Um, some ideas of containers here. So if you're familiar with the idea of Kubernetes or Docker or things like that, um, Azure has very robust container services. 
And then the last piece here that's really big is databases. So you can see there's a lot of options here from Azure about um, databases. So we can run not just Microsoft SQL databases, but we also have the ability to run Cosmos and Postgres and MySQL or Mariah da uh, databases is just an example. There's also Mongo. Um, there are other options available here too. And on top of just the databases, there's the ability to, for example, to do um, elastic pools, there's the ability to do um, analytics and data analysis and machine learning and all kinds of things that can layer on top of this too. Uh, data warehousing is another example. Um, so a couple more categories here we'll just run through briefly. They're, they're not as used as heavily, but analytics I mentioned just a couple times. So um, Microsoft has a service that's called Power BI and it's a fantastic uh, business intelligence tool, very friendly for end users. Again, as friendly as data uh, analytics and business intelligence can be. Um, and that's really powerful and it can easily tie into data that's in Azure, although it can tie into local data and spreadsheets and things like that too, web data also. Um, but then we've got things like Synapse, um, which is essentially a, a kind of a machine learning sort of ability um, to do analytics. There's other machine learning options available here too. Um, and there's the ability to manage massive, massive amounts of data <clears throat> that would be extremely difficult to manage internally within our own environment. The size and cost and complexity of the servers required to compete with Azure's ability to manage data would be astronomical. So AI and machine learning, I kind of mentioned uh, Synapse once before, but there's also things like cognitive services, there's uh, speech services, things like that, machine learning, um, lots and lots of capabilities there. Uh, Internet of Things, we, we won't talk about that a whole lot, but if um, if you do need to connect out to devices, so if you've got smart devices, especially ones that are um, out in the field or, or um, uh, permanently installed, that kind of thing, um, that's referred to as IoT. <clears throat> and then integration, we won't get into that a whole bunch. Identity is another piece. <clears throat> Excuse me one second. So identity is another piece, um, and this is one area that is very heavily used within Azure. Uh, it's very, very, it's a really big pro of using Azure is because these identity services in here are not only powerful and flexible and scalable, <clears throat> but they are either built on or built compatible with the traditional Azure, uh, excuse me, not Azure, Active Directory uh, identity services that Microsoft utilizes and that most of us utilize inside of our corporate networks. Um, so it's really, really easy to integrate this identity with the, the, our existing identity services that we have today. And then we can do things like single sign-on and multi-factor authentication and so on that can all be built off of this. Um, so if we're building websites, um, for example, or we have, um, or we consume websites for that matter, if they have the ability to integrate with single sign-on, there's a really good chance that they can integrate with the Azure identity services. So then the same password that logs us into our computer can log us into our email, can log us into that website or that service. Um, and it makes it really streamlined for our users. Uh, but it also makes it easier to secure because if a password is compromised, we can change it you know, one time and it changes across all of the, the services. Or if a user is terminated, they can be terminated in one spot and they immediately lose access to all of the services, for example. Likewise, adding staff is simplified because we only have to add them in one place and they immediately gain access to all of the services that are connected. Um, so security obviously is a big thing. We're, we're unfortunately not going to have a lot of time to talk about security today, but um, the identity service of Active Directory is a big piece of that. So Windows Defender is another piece. I mentioned Azure Information Protection, Azure Threat Protection, um, our other pieces in here, Azure, Azure Sentinel. So these are all really powerful, um, very, very useful services for security um, and ways that we can increase our security, not just in our cloud necessarily. Many of these services can increase our data security and our uh, device security as well. Last few here, just super quick. So DevOps, migration, you can see monitoring, management and governance, obviously, um, and then Intune, hybrid, and other. So those are the last categories here. Uh, again, unfortunately, there's so much available here, we don't have time to go through all of that in Azure. Let me just show you one thing, though, about <clears throat> the capability of cloud. So for example, if I wanted to add a virtual machine, I want to make a new server, perhaps I have a new software that I, that's going to be uh, deployed for my business and it needs its own server, for example. I, you know, I can go buy a server, I can, we can plug it in, we can set it up, we can install Windows on it, we can run updates and reboot it seven times, we can install our antivirus, like all of those pieces. That process typically takes days or possibly a week um, and for sure, in best case scenario, it probably still takes at least hours, even if you already have the physical server. But I can come over to 
uh, a cloud service like Azure, for example, I can go to virtual machines and I can decide that I want to add a virtual machine. So I just go ahead and click create, create virtual machine, and I'll show you. It's just going to walk me through this wizard. It's really, really easy. So I pick some options here. I'm going to give my machine a name here, and I'm just going to call it Azure Cloud Demo. And I'll accept most of the defaults here just for the sake of being quick. Um, <clears throat> one thing to notice is sometimes people, I think, they feel that because it's Microsoft Service Azure that you can only do Windows things in it. Uh, but that's really not true. Um, for example, you can see just in some of the most common images available to install on my virtual machine, you know, Ubuntu Server, SUSE Linux, Red Hat, Debian, Oracle Linux, CentOS. Um, there's a whole variety of Linuxes, for example, that are available here too, in addition to all of the Windows capabilities that are there. Microsoft in the last few years has done a really good job of embracing open source, and I think that's just, I think it's the right thing to do. I think it's been really huge, and it adds a lot of flexibility for them too. Um, I can pick my sizes here too, so in this process I can pick, um, and there's a whole ton more than just this. So for example, if I want to go see all of these sizes, um, there's, there's all of these different options over here, and so on. I'll go back here. All right, so we need to Azure Cloud will be our username. And we're going to make a password real quick. So we'll save that password. Since this is a Windows server, uh, it's going to give me some options here for remote management, uh, remote connections. We tip, it's a good idea to not open anything to the outside world that we don't need to, right? Every possibility for connection from the outside world is a possibility for attackers and hackers and things like that uh, to come in and compromise. Um, in our case, I'm going to leave RDP open, which is the ability to connect remotely to the desktop, and I'm just going to add HTTP. This, again, is just a demo. Um, I wouldn't normally leave these things wide open to the world otherwise. So we can uh, go ahead and create this. This is a live demo, so things can and do go wrong. I've done enough live demos before to just basically expect something will <laughs> go wrong. Um, but hopefully not. So here you can see this. Now it's given me updates, so the deployment is in progress. Um, and while it's doing this, I just want to talk briefly about a couple other things here. Um, but in the meantime, keep an eye on this and see how quickly this deployment goes. Um, so you can already see some real-time feedback there on the progress of this. Um, one of the other things that's really interesting about the cloud um, is the, I, I kind of mentioned the evolution, right? This, this progress of the cloud. Um, and so there are things that are taking place in the cloud that are, um, you know, new. I don't want to be hyperbolic here, but they're going to change the way that we look at and that we expect IT services to work in the future. Um, and some of this is starting with the cloud and then you know some of it feeds back into our business organization. But a lot of these things are going to just take our, you know, they're going to happen in the cloud. And there really isn't going to be a migration path into our network. It's going to be in the cloud first. And if you want to utilize it, you have to utilize it in the cloud. And the cloud, you know, in general, um, like software as a service, has this idea that the up grade, the update process is under the control of the cloud provider. And so they can, they can iterate so much faster. When a new version of software comes out that has to be installed on desktops and we need to wait for it to be adopted, that has to be installed on you know, numerous desktops across the country or across the world, right? Literally millions or billions of desktops would need to get upgraded to switch to the new version of Office or the new version of Windows or things like that. But when it's in the cloud, the new versions, the, the improvements and all that kind of thing, they can be rolled out essentially immediately. And then everybody who utilizes those can just begin taking advantage of that. And so that's a really powerful feature and powerful capability. And it's a definite advantage to utilizing the cloud. So here we go. I talked so long that I already uh, missed when the deployment was complete. But you can see how quick that was done. Um, that was literally just a matter of a minute or two to get that created. So this literally created a server 
in Azure that we can now connect to. So for example, if I want to connect to it, I can just go here and I can say I want to connect to RDP. And I'll load, download that RDP file. I'm just going to put that on my desktop. Okay, and once it's downloaded, I'm just going to open that and connect. Okay, and we call this account Azure Cloud. <clears throat> And I'll paste in my password. And so in that little bit of time, storage was allocated, processors were allocated, software was imaged or installed, and a server is ready to be connected to. And this is a full-fledged Windows server, um, just like any that you could run inside your own network. It's going to be a little bit slower to log into this first time, um, because that's that's just common with Windows. It has to create my profile for the first time and some of those other kind of things. Um, but here you can see, for example, that that's my um, that's a Windows server. So you can see I, I've got a start menu. Um, I could start utilizing it for any of the things that I could normally use a server for, including I could install software on it, things like that too. Um, and from here we can manage it just like we normally would manage um, our servers. So we've got a, a GUI interface, for example. And we've got the ability to use tools like PowerShell and so on. Okay, so you can see it just it runs normal Windows software, like exactly like what you'd expect. Again, it's a little bit slow. It's just starting up. Right, that's singular. There we go. That's what I was waiting for is the auto-complete the tool help to show up. So I just issued a PowerShell command to uh, add the server role of being a web server to the specific server. So we'll just give that a second to finish. Okay, it's getting pretty close. <clears throat> so I'm going to go back here to my management of my server, and I'm going to copy this IP address. And we'll see if I'm faster or if the server is faster. If I try to go to that IP address. Okay, so if I'm faster, this, yep, the web server is not quite installed yet. Um, so we should see that this fails, which is nice for demo purposes. Okay, so clearly that nothing answered on that server address. There we go. Okay, so once the web server role has been installed on the server, now if I go back and refresh my web page, there we go. So you can clearly see that it's that easy, right? I just in I've spun up a virtual server um, and I installed a web server on it, and literally it took minutes. And I have a fully functioning web server. I could begin uploading my web files, my application, web application, um, things like that. I could install a database, all those kind of things. It is a server that I can do whatever I want with. So next thing I want to demo just really quick, here's another example of a cloud service. So this also uses the same kind of infrastructure as Azure. Um, this is a more like user-directed cloud service. And so this one is called Windows 365. Windows 365 is a subscription service that anybody can sign up for and receive a Windows desktop computer, virtual computer, in the cloud that runs in Azure, for example. And with that, um, it's really, really simple. We log into windows365.microsoft.com with our login credentials. I can click open in a browser, and I actually have access to a virtual computer through my browser. This is the computer that I use um, most of the time for my daily use. 
and it's again it's fully functional. So on this virtual computer in the cloud, so you can see on the bottom of my screen, I've got my normal toolbar here for my local computer, but then I've got a toolbar for my remote computer. And all of this is inside of a web browser, right? So I can literally take this and, you know, I can resize my web browser. I can move it around. It's, it's literally a web browser. And uh, inside of this, I can run applications. So for example, I could open my email. I can run Teams. I can do web browsing. I can access the file server. I can have OneDrive sync my files. Like all of the standard stuff that I could normally do from a desktop, I can do from this Windows 365. And we could have a whole session just on Windows 365 and the benefits of virtual desktops. Um, let me just say some things about this that are really, really cool is uh, here I am accessing it through a browser. So that means I didn't need any special software installed at all to be able to access this Windows 365. Um, that means that I could access it from anywhere that I have access to a web browser and internet access, right? Um, in addition, there are clients that I can install that will enable me to access it from a smartphone. So I literally can access this from an uh, Android or iOS smartphone. I don't know how often you'd want to work on your desktop computer on a little tiny uh, phone screen, but it's possible. I've done it. Um, I can also access it from uh, iPad, for example. Um, and so that's really neat. And then there is, of course, a, a client that we can install onto Windows computers that can make it a little bit simpler to access to. But by and large, it's actually really, really easy to do. So that's really cool. Okay, now I'm going to make another transition here. I'm going to move over to the whiteboard and uh, we're going to just whiteboard up a couple of the other scenarios for how we can utilize cloud services. So bear with me. I'll be right back. Okay, so one of the first scenarios we'll look at is, for example, moving, um, putting a web site or web files uh, into the cloud, for example. So if we're just talking about web, um, we might have this idea of a web server and the web server that we have today might be in our local network, right? We might want to have web files that we're providing access to, for example, our customers or the World Wide Web. So one way that we can easily do this is we can just move this to a virtual machine. Okay, and so that means just that same process that I did. We spin up a virtual server, we, in, we install the web server role on it, and we can start putting our web files into that. Obviously, there's a little bit more technical stuff with DNS and so on, um, but, but at its core, that's all we have to do. So advantage of that is that virtual machine then is completely separated from our business network, right? Because this one is in the cloud, this is our local network. So in terms of security, we've just now increased our security because if our virtual machine is ever compromised, there is no direct link to our corporate network, our business network. And if, if instead we're hosting this server inside of our business facility on our network, now we have much greater needs, security concerns for um, keeping those two separate and keeping that private. Does that make sense? Another really easy thing that we can do here is we can use what's called a content delivery network. So what this is, is we put files in that are static files. They're things that don't change like uh, images or uh, resources like PDF files, things like that. Um, can be JavaScript, um, those kind of things, JavaScript common libraries and so on. So they go in what's called a content delivery network. And what that means is that Azure has special servers set up that can host that stuff for us. And then those high bandwidth, uh, that high bandwidth information comes into the content delivery network and then wherever we have our web server, this can still be a virtual server or it can still be the server that you know, is in our location. It could be in a, a web hosting facility, whatever. Um, it only serves the, the dynamic data comes off of here. Oops, sorry for my bad writing. So this is where things like, you know, uh, uh, we look up our invoices, for example, if we let clients see or pay their bills online, you know, that's dynamic data. That changes depending on who's logged in and what they're trying to see. But all the things like our logo and our, again, JavaScript files and, you know, those kind of things, that stuff could all be delivered from the content delivery network. So this has the advantage that it speeds up the website for our, um, for our visitors because they can get some of it, what they need, still from the resources that we have. But now we've offloaded some of the resources to these really high speed, high capability networks. Okay, does that make sense? Azure also has this ability that we can move everything um, <clears throat> into Azure through this idea of an Azure, um, 
and Azure web sites or Azure web pools. And so this idea here is that um, we move our site into this, but now in the background, um, Azure takes care of the scalability factor. If we do this first version, we have one virtual server. We still only have one web server. If it crashes or if it gets overloaded, it's one server. Um, yes, we can spin up more, but then we have to manage that, and then we have to manage load balancing and all of those other pieces. Here, if we use one of the Azure services, like Azure Web Services, um, that automatically gives us the ability to scale uh, and, and handle that kind of workload growth dynamic, um, you know, load, dynamic load management is handled by Azure. So whether there's a little bit of data coming in or, a, or excuse me, a little bit of requests coming in or a lot of requests coming in, Azure will scale that up and spool up extra instances for us and that kind of thing. So that's something that's available that's really cool. And then um, another one of the pieces that's kind of related to this, but this idea of like Azure functions. Um, so these can be things like APIs and so on um, that we might have applications in. You know, they need to have access to data. Uh, this starts to get into programming software development and a little bit more complicated, but we have a way, for example, that we don't have to utilize our web servers to provide API data or API interfaces and those kind of things. So that's another way that we can use it. So just to demonstrate, there's a lot, and this is still not everything, obviously, that Azure can do, but there's multiple ways here that we can utilize Azure, for example, just in terms of hosting our, our web services and web resources. Okay, so that's one example. Another example is, is infrastructure. So we already talked about virtual servers, so that's obviously the easiest one. Um, you know, we may have an application that just, that needs its own server, and there's no reason it has to be in our local network inside our facility, so, and we don't wanna have to go buy a physical server, and it's one more thing to manage and maintain and, and you know, recycle and all that kind of stuff, so maybe it's time to put that in a virtual server. So just like in the first example, um, we put that into a virtual server in Azure. Um, you saw in the demo that we can spin that up in a matter of minutes, that's super, super quick. Um, and again, it has an advantage that it's outside of our business network over here. So if we do need to provide you know, anybody else access to this, they're not in our network here. Say for example, we have an application where we have outside consultants or vendors that need access to, mount it, to manage and maintain it. Um, by, doing, by putting it in Azure, if we give them access to manage or maintain this, they don't, they're not coming in our business network. They're very, very much separated from us. So that's really useful. Um, we can also do that in a, a sense where we put this in Azure, so we still have a virtual machine here in Azure, um, and we have our resources here <clears throat> in our corporate network, um, and these can be connected together. So I've got a server here, or servers, and I've got a server here, and now we establish a connection between them two, and they share workloads. This is that example of hybrid. So we don't have to move everything, but we take some of the workload that's being done in-house and we move it into the cloud and, and you know, work, to, words, work to orchestrate those together, potentially even load balance and that kind of thing if we possibly can there too. So there's another example. We can also go fully virtual. So within Azure, we can have our virtual server here and then we can have virtual desktops um, as the example that I showed earlier with the Windows 365. Azure has a thing that's called Azure Virtual Desktops and so we can put Azure virtual desktops in Azure along with virtual servers, and now our whole infrastructure is up here. That means that our requirements uh, within our corporate network now are really just good internet access and then some kind of you know, low power device that is able to you know, open a browser or um, uh, run a remote desktop connection up to here. The other advantage that this has, of course, is that there, we can bring in remote people and they have access to the same resources. So whether they're in the corporate network or whether they're remote, they all have access to the same, you know, the same resources are up here. We don't have to establish VPNs back to the corporate office. We don't have to compromise security of our corporate network to bring those people back in. So there's just another example where we can utilize Azure for that kind of stuff very easily. Hey, so those are two examples. Um, we can obviously cover uh, many others, but one of the other ones that I mentioned was just SQL. So SQL, same thing. We can have a SQL server or servers in our local network. We can take a, a virtual machine 
and we can make that a SQL server, so it runs SQL here. Um, if we do this, we have total control over it, but it's just one server. If we want to make it reliable, or, uh, redundant, we've got to set up clustering and all of those pieces ourselves. And we can certainly do that. We have control. We can spin up more than one virtual machine. But Azure has a thing that's called Azure SQL, which is a database as a service, basically, or platform as a service. Um, and so with Azure SQL, you know, we're not managing a server. We just have a an, an SQL management interface where we manage the Azure SQL. But in the background, Azure is taking it runs on many, 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 many servers that are all clustered and redundant and load balancing and so on for us. And it just scales up. It's based on how much transactions we put through it and how much data we use. So it's very, very scalable, very, very flexible. So that's another example that's really easy. Um, storage. I mentioned there's this idea of Azure Files. <clears throat> so Azure Files is platform as a service. Basically, this is a share, a network share. So this could be like our Z drive, for example. Um, that could be an, an example of Azure Files. So this is a, a you know, almost infinitely expanding amount of storage that we can use that's in the cloud. Um, it's you know, redundant, reliable, all of those kind of things in the cloud, but we still access it in the normal way that we're used to. Now, Azure has plenty of other examples. Azure also has this idea of blob storage, for example, um, where we can just kind of put raw data into this blob storage, however, you know, whatever we want, mix, match, all that kind of stuff, and it's got its own interface for that and its own you know, storage explorer and those kind of pieces. So. so those are just some of the examples here. So let me switch back again to my computer here, and we will begin our wrap-up. So some questions about Azure specifically. Why or why not choose Azure? Um, some advantages I feel Azure has is Microsoft is investing very, very heavily in Azure. Uh, there's already over 200 types of services available through Azure, and Microsoft has introduced over 1,000 new capabilities just in the past year. It's very secure. Microsoft invests over a billion dollars annually and has over 3,500 security experts maintaining the security of Azure. Azure is gaining ground on Amazon Web Services or AWS in terms of market share. And I don't think that would be true if they didn't have a very good, if not better, product. Um, Azure easily has the top performance in terms of hybrid environment if you've already got an established Windows infrastructure. So if you use Windows desktops, if you use Windows servers, you're going to have a much easier path integrating things with Azure than trying to use something like AWS or Google, for example. And it costs. If Again, if you're utilizing Microsoft technologies in the cloud, Azure is significantly less expensive than AWS. So as an example, it's about five times less expensive than AWS for Windows servers, for example, or SQL, if you want to put those in the cloud. Some of the benefits I kind of mentioned, increased uh, integration. Um, Azure is highly utilized, so over 95% of Fortune 500 companies utilize Azure. It's very highly secure. They have over 90 certifications. They have over 60 data centers, and Azure is growing 98% year over year. I'm, I apologize. I know we're at time. Um, if you have to drop off, I totally understand. Otherwise, I just have a little bit more that I'll cover here. Um, Azure does have different subscription types, so commercial is probably the main one that you know most organizations use, but they do have pricing for nonprofits, for education, and then they have multiple tiers for government, so government cloud, um, high security government cloud, DOD, secret, and even top secret layers of Azure. So in terms of strategy, what's the best cloud strategy? Unfortunately, there is no one-size-fits-all strategy. You really have to start with determining what are your needs. Are you looking to, to scale your business, scale your IT, reduce costs, reduce, uh, increase efficiency, uh, increase security, or roll out new capabilities? And then from there, determine which cloud solutions are available, and then consider the integration advantages of whichever one that you pick, and then obviously plan, test, and deploy. Um, Hopefully this helps. Hopefully I answered some questions about Azure. Um, for some of you, it might be the first time you've seen very much about Azure. For others, you, you know a lot about Azure. Um, either way, I hope this was helpful and I maybe piqued your interest on some of these things. If so, and you have other questions for me, you can certainly follow up with me. Again, my name is Wes Henry. My email address is on the screen there. It's just wes.henry at trit.com. And if you have questions about Azure or uh, TrueIT services in general, um, I'd ask you to reach out to Randy Philippi. Randy is our business development specialist, and his phone number and his email address are right there on the screen. It's just randy.philippi at trueit.com. And with that, I want to say thank you very much to all of you for attending. <laughs>